hurricane descends. New Orleans is on the run. At Tulane Hospital, there's no escape for the critically ill. All visitors are advised to now leave the hospital. Those on life support can't leave. If the power fails, they die. New Orleans faces one of the worst storms of the century, Hurricane Katrina. Within hours, a safe haven will become a prison for the patients and those who care for them. Look, I can't. OK, look, we're not going. We're not leaving our baby. Hurricane Katrina rages across Louisiana. In New Orleans, Tulane Medical Center braces for the worst. Dr. Bob Asciutto is on call, staying overnight at Tulane. He's jolted awake by the sound of breaking windows. I went to my door to open it, and it was pulled out of my hand. I felt this force pulling me towards a um, window that was uh, now broken. And I could see the air currents going out the window, along with an, a fair number of debris that was in the laboratory. Several colleagues struggle to pull him to safety. The hurricane knocks out the city's power. Hospital emergency generators kick in. Dr. Asciutto heads straight for the intensive care unit. Well, the hallways were uh, very quiet. Uh, there was a, a calmness that was eerie. Uh, even though outside the building this horrific storm was going on, inside uh, there was this very strange claustrophobic feeling of warmth, uh, sweating. Um, I actually felt my heart pounding. Dr. Asciutto is responsible for several critically ill children. If their life support machines fail, they will die. How's she doing? Let's have a listen here. He's relieved to find all his patients unharmed, including Drew Schaff, a newborn baby recovering from heart surgery. Drew was a very seriously ill infant. She was on a ventilator, was on various heart medications to allow the heart to beat properly. Drew's parents, Steve and Brandy Schaff, live 200 kilometers away. But they haven't been home since their baby was rushed to hospital more than a week ago. It was 11 o'clock at night and she was just fussing and fussing and then she turned bluish gray and stopped breathing and we rushed her to the hospital. Before the hurricane struck, all patients' families were asked to leave the hospital. I can't. OK, well, look, we're not leaving. We're not, we're not leaving our baby. Brandy simply refused. I knew that I was not leaving my baby by herself in a city that I didn't even live in. All right, how you doing, William? Dr. Asciutto's patients and all others on life support have been moved onto the same floor, so staff can watch them constantly. One of the patients most at risk is 15-year-old William Wilson. He depends on a huge machine to keep blood pumping through his body. Without it, he will die within minutes. During the 10 months William's been waiting for a heart transplant, nurse Jean Braham has become his friend and confidant. You have rather a thin boy 
with four garden hoses, essentially, coming out of him. It was a little science fiction-esque. Hey, Gene, looks like we both get a workout. <laughs> yeah. If not for that, he was your, your average 15-year-old boy. In the light of day, an eerie calm engulfs New Orleans. It looks like the hospital's disaster plan is working. In reality, a bigger and deadlier crisis is unfolding. New Orleans is built on land below sea level. The day Hurricane Katrina reaches landfall, several of the levees protecting the city weaken and then fail. By evening, the flood has closed in on Tulane Hospital. Water seeps into the building and floods the ground floor. The hospital's diesel-powered emergency generators are on the ground floor. Mo, it seems as though I'm losing diesel fuel. I can't lose generators four and five. The floodwaters are rising by one-third of a meter an hour. At this rate, the generators will be swamped by morning. The hospital's emergency command center is unable to get a response from city authorities. So they call the state emergency center, 130 kilometers away in Baton Rouge. Mel Lagarde, a senior hospital executive, tries to find out whether the state can provide any kind of support or security. Look, our generators will be flooded in hours. And I've got kids on fence. I need to know if there's an evacuation plan for hospitals. Lagarde learns that the entire city is in chaos. There's no help coming. I'm sorry, Mel. For Tulane Hospital, only one option remains. Guys, hold up a sec. We need to evacuate. The hospital is forced to organize its own evacuation. With ground routes flooded, the only way out is by air. Staff will have to find a way to fly Drew Schaff, William Wilson, and 19 other critical care patients to safety in the next few hours. By then, the emergency generators will either run out of fuel or be swamped by flood water. The best bet is Acadian Ambulance Services, more than 200 kilometers away in Lafayette. Look, I've got 13 neonatals, four PICUs, and four adults on vents. Acadian's dispatcher alerts the company's flight paramedic, Mark Creswell. Within the hour, Creswell is loading his helicopter with supplies. It was just something that was a sixth sense that said, bring plenty of clothes, bring a couple of hundred dollars worth of food, bring several hundred dollars in cash, and anything else you think you're gonna need for a week, and that's what I did. But the winds are swirling in 60 kilometer gusts, enough to damage the aircraft upon landing. Even for a veteran pilot, it's just too dangerous to fly. We knew our primary mission that morning was to evacuate babies. I knew how to have my A game on. While Mark Creswell sits grounded 200 kilometers away, the water is still rising in New Orleans creeping ever closer to the emergency generators on the ground floor of Tulane Hospital. Thank 
They're on their way. Pete, how much time do we have? Probably about half an hour. Early Tuesday morning, senior executive Mel Lagarde finds out that the hospital has to turn off the emergency generators on the ground floor. The rising floodwaters will short-circuit the machines within minutes. Is there anything else you can do for me? We need at least two hours on this. Yes, do we have any pumps available for us to pump out the water? Get Greg to give me some temporary electricity. There's only one way left to keep the electricity flowing. Electrical workers fire up a portable generator truck in the street outside. The hospital has rented it in preparation for the hurricane. But if the water keeps rising, this generator will also become submerged. A nurse wakes baby Drew's parents in the middle of the night. Steve, the hospital's flooding. We're evacuating. But I More alarming news for Steve and Brandy Schaff. Okay. Attention all staff, code yellow. Attention all staff, code yellow. Thanks. The hospital plans to evacuate their baby without them. We didn't know they were evacuating at all. She's like, they're gonna ship Drew out soon. Y'all need to come tell her bye. And I mean, I flew. I had pajamas on and no, but didn't brush my teeth. I just ran down there. Where are they taking my baby? They don't know yet. I, I was in shock. I mean, I ran down there and I was like, wait, explain this to me. It's not easy to escape New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans is a swimming pool in and of itself. Water came in from the levees. There was no way for it to get back out again. It's a one-way street. I've got some good news. We're flying out in a chopper, and they are super cool. Are, are you coming with me? Of course. Nurse Jean Braham tells William about the evacuation. He tries not to alarm his young patient. William's evacuation will be exceptionally challenging. He'll need a specially equipped helicopter with medical equipment and a generator on board. The chopper must be large and powerful enough to accommodate William's 227 kilogram life support machine. William Wilson was on a uh, so-called biventricular assist device. That means it's a device that pumps blood from the pumping chamber on the right side circulates it to the left side as it's oxygenated, and then to the body. A tube comes out of the right side of his heart into the machine. A tube goes to the main vessel, carrying blood to the body. So his heart is non-functional. His heart simply serves as a reservoir to collect blood for this machine. Nurse Braham asks other staff to make sure each patient is evacuated with a one-week supply of medicine and fluids. He spent 20 years in the Navy. Crisis management is second nature. The medicine dispenser has lost power and can't dispense any drugs. It's time to bend the rules. We're leaving. Break open the machine. Now! Tulane Hospital is now operating with limited air conditioning and lighting. The generator truck outside can only supply 40% of the hospital's electricity. 
From now on, only the hospital's emergency red sockets have power. They run the most essential services. One of them is the life support machine keeping Drew alive. Orion O'Meara, Texas Children's Hospital, okay? Make sure it's, it's okay, sick. Dr. Asciutto tries to ease the anxiety of parents about to be separated from their children. It's going to be fine. And no one is going to be lost or sent to the wrong hospital. I give you my word. The staff come up with a system to make sure that every patient is accounted for once the crisis is over. The nurses improvise using simple but effective methods. They realized that they were in control of the lives of these patients. And they had to do things, not only urgently, but they had to use creativity to accomplish their goal. The goal was to get the patient out of the hospital. And they used their imagination to the fullest. When Drew was being prepared for transport, one of the nurses came and she had her camera and she took a picture of all three of us and gave it to us so we could have it to take with us. By now, floodwaters are threatening the one remaining backup generator outside. Dr. Asciutto and Tulane staff have been on the phone for hours, calling hospitals outside New Orleans. They're trying to find places for the critical care patients. Drew Schaff, S-C-H-A-A-F. She's post-op for an aortic obstruction. This kid is really sick. We have to get her out of here now. They'll take her, Dr. Gutierrez at Lafayette Children's. Asciutto finally finds a place for Drew at a hospital in her hometown of Lafayette. Moving Drew without disturbing her life support equipment will be a delicate and risky job. I need these tubes taped securely for transport. Drew's flying up by chopper. It's gonna be fine, I promise. Drew has a large hole between the pumping chambers of her heart, so a band must be placed around her artery to reduce blood flow to the lungs. Because she is in such severe heart failure, she must be intubated. A tube in her trachea enables her to breathe. In her case, intubation was very difficult because she had abnormal anatomy of her, of her airway. It's always more difficult in a baby, and the smaller the baby, the more difficult the procedure. But in her case, she had the confounding factor of abnormal anatomy. So we were very fearful that if her tube came out, um, we would be in trouble. In Lafayette, the wind has died down. Three hours after paramedic Mark Creswell got the call, his air ambulance heads for Tulane Hospital. He's borrowed a critical piece of equipment from a local hospital. He'll need it to evacuate Drew Shaw. I called a nurse at one of the local hospitals, an ICU manager, and I asked for their, uh, their uh, isolate, which is a form of an incubator with a lot of advanced life support gear. And they were readily able to give that to us, no questions asked. Creswell flies over New Orleans just after dawn. He's stunned to see the city submerged below. My first impression of Katrina was, wow, I've never seen anything like this. And how am I gonna handle it? 
There's no longer any air traffic control regulating flight over New Orleans. The possibility of a mid-air collision is on everyone's mind. Essentially, we were flying blind. We had to use your eyes and keep an eye out for every aircraft around. There were literally uh, dozens of Coast Guard and military aircraft on scene. Creswell finally lands on the garage roof next to Tulane Hospital. He sees that the building is surrounded by almost two meters of water. I knew that as fast as this water was coming up, they weren't going to have power much longer. Nobody knows how quickly the water will rise and just when the generator will flood. Creswell does know he has to get 21 life support patients out of Tulane before the power goes out. Good Lord. Nice to see you. Everyone had looked like they had been through a terrorist incident. They were, their eyes were big. They looked like they had been in this incident for days and days and days. They were obviously scared, and the sense of urgency was real high. As the flight paramedic, Creswell's in charge of the overall evacuation. But first, he has to decide who gets evacuated in what order. Creswell is asked to fly patients to various hospitals scattered hundreds of kilometers in all directions. He's frustrated. For every long haul trip to a faraway hospital, his team could be making several shorter trips and evacuating more patients. So the closer we were able to go, the better it would be to be able to get everyone out. Morning. OK. OK, now, these are the patients we want. Now, we want the sick, sick, sick ones, starting with the littlest, because we have isolates coming in. Now, we want to load as many people as we can, so we need the sick, little ones matched with adults that can monitor themselves. No parents, no riders. And we're going to get this all done before you lose power. It's an ambitious evacuation. Creswell will have to juggle an enormous amount of information. Who's the sickest? What does each patient weigh? Which rescue helicopter is equipped to carry them? He quickly decides which of the infants is top priority. She's first. He's picked Drew Schaff. She was a very sick kid. I didn't know all the details, but I knew she was sick. You can see a big, huge surgical scar down her chest, lots of IV tubings on her, uh, lots of bandages. And I knew that she was a priority, and this was the first kid we needed to get out. We needed to get her out now. Staff prepare to move Drew from her hospital bed into the special portable incubator. She was awake for the first time since her surgery, and so I was like, great, she's, she's starting to wake up and they're gonna put her in a, heli in a little incubator in a helicopter and send her back. Moving Drew is complicated and risky. If her breathing tube is accidentally knocked out during transport, she will die within five to 10 minutes. A respiratory specialist ensures that the tube is perfectly placed in her tiny trachea to minimize movement. Drew's heart also depends on life-saving medicine. After the transfer to the incubator, Drew's team monitors her oxygen saturation, heart rate, temperature, and respiration rate. They watch closely to make sure her skin color stays healthy. The slightest tinge of blue means immediate intervention. I absolutely remember those last few minutes before they took her. It was hard. I mean, I was, I was a mess. I was crying. I said, look, we gotta, we're going to get through this. we got to get ourselves together. Let's help out however we can. Just get your mind off it. Know your baby girl is going to be fine, and we're going to get you out of here. And uh, so she held up really well. 
After five minutes, Drew is considered stable. Now she can be transported to the helicopter. Getting to the makeshift helipad will be a journey in itself. Drew will have to be transported from the hospital's fourth floor down to the second floor. Here, the rescuers will enter an elevated walkway that links the hospital to the parking garage next door. Then, up another six floors to the garage roof. The elevator is the smoothest way to carry Drew down two floors. But as the rescue team enters, the door suddenly jams. then slams shut before Brandy can get back in. I like freaked out because, oh my God, they're in the elevator. I'm not gonna be able to see Drew again. And the nurses start, it's okay, it's okay. We're gonna get her out. We're gonna get out. We're gonna get to you. It, it'll be okay. And the guy that was standing on the other side of me, just helping, he pulled the doors open and everybody got out. they decide it's too risky to use the elevator. We're gonna need those flashlights. They're forced to carry Drew in her 91 kilogram incubator down two flights of stairs. Steve isn't happy, but he knows they have no choice. Careful! The floors were sweating because they had lost ACs, so it was very slippery. Lights were flashing from the emergency lights, trying to come on and off. Um, the air was just really stale, and it was, I mean, just kind of like something you'd see in a movie. The team strains to keep the incubator perfectly balanced. The tiniest misstep the most minuscule shift could dislodge Drew's breathing tube. Don't drop it! Bringing Drew down uh, the stairs in the incubator on the stretcher was very nerve-wracking. Knowing if we just, you know, rock it or do anything wrong with it, um, uh, ventilator down our throat kind of scared me. It takes Drew's team more than 20 minutes just to get down two flights of stairs. Drew isn't out of danger yet. As they enter the raised walkway, the reality of their situation hits home. When uh, I came downstairs and we were walking across and I saw the water in the street, what really uh, got my attention was the generators that were sitting outside and the water was coming up to the bottom of the generators that are on parking 18 wheeler trailers. And I knew that Drew wasn't the only person on a ventilator at that time and if they would lose electricity, I was kind of getting scared. Drew's parents and her medical team managed to transport her as far as the parking garage next to the hospital. They head for the makeshift helipad on the garage roof. And I just had to take a big gulp. I mean, it just like, a little bit of fear just crept me. I was like, wow, this is pretty serious. It takes them almost an hour to get Drew from her hospital bed to the waiting helicopter. One of the pilots suggests that Drew and another baby double up in the incubator to speed up the evacuation. But Drew's nurse recognizes the other child. You can't put these two babies together. She's just got a tracheotomy. It's likely she's infected. It's another close call for baby Drew. Drew will travel with her nurse, but without her parents. I'm sorry, I can't take you with her. There's just no room. Well, when will I see Drew? Mark Creswell can't tell Brandy when she'll be able to see her baby again. One way or another, I'll get you there. It 
it was it was good, Richie. I mean, there's nothing you can do because they're taking your baby away from you again. <laughs> 15-year-old William Wilson is still trapped at Tulane. Staff are trying to find a way to evacuate him along with his 227 kilogram life support machine. So far, they've not been able to find a big enough helicopter. It's hard to believe that things could get any worse. But now the hospital is battling more than mother nature. Looters are trying to force their way in. It was like Baghdad on the Mississippi River. They were just looting to steal stuff at that point. It wasn't, you know, like you need diapers for your child. It was a TV on a piece of plywood. I know many of us were very angry about what was going on in the streets and what we were witnessing. We were ashamed. I was ashamed. Uh, I couldn't believe this was going on in our country. Outsiders are trying to sneak in through the parking garage. Police rush to keep them out. It was always the assumption that people needed their fix, the people that were addicted to medicines. So that could have been a, a reason to break into the hospital. They also saw helicopters coming and going. So they saw it as a means of rescue also, maybe. All the while, Mark Creswell keeps the evacuation moving. I mean, it, it was very exhilarating to see an individual wheeled up to a waiting helicopter, a critically ill child, placed on the helicopter, safely evacuated. And each time oh, a child left, people would applaud. He's directing pilots and helicopters from Louisiana and out of state as they land on the roof of the parking garage. How much fuel you got left? How much weight can you take on this thing? Creswell doesn't know how each helicopter is equipped until they actually land. That means that he can't plan ahead. He's forced to figure out on the spot which patient leaves next based on a mental calculation. You got a neonate on board? Then he determines the most efficient use of each helicopter. Get me a neonate on a vent and a nurse that needs to go as far as Lafayette or Alexandria now. Evacuation isn't going as quickly as Creswell would like. Only three to four helicopters at a time are allowed on the garage roof. It takes roughly an hour to move two patients. By 3 p.m., they've evacuated 13 patients on life support. Creswell uses a satellite phone to call his coordinator at Acadian Ambulance. I need helicopters. I called Mike Sonia. I said, man, I need everything you got. I need every helicopter you can find. I called my dad, who was a superintendent at a local oil company. I said, call all your friends. Tell them we need all the helicopters. Um, I knew a pilot in the Army, and I called him, and I said, man, call anybody you can at the Pentagon or whatever and get every Army helicopter you can. We in a bind. As helicopters come and go, Brandy pitches in, bringing food to the pilots. Part of Creswell's strategy to keep stranded parents calm. We put them to work making ham sandwiches, and I had kept, had kept their daughter that was 200 miles away off of their mind. They had a sense of purpose there. They weren't sitting around twiddling their thumbs, I'm quite sure it passed the time for them. It kept our minds off of it for a few minutes. To save time and keep his hands free, Creswell has written down the coordinates of each hospital on his own leg. And it just stayed there. It was like a permanent uh, uh, reference card. And pilots would land, and 
it was so loud because of the, the turbines that you just point to them and they'd program the GPS in with the coordinates. And it was just one of the innovations that we came up with while we were over there. The generator outside is still above water. But there's only enough fuel left to last until sunset. For the past eight hours, Mark Creswell has been trying to find a way to reunite Brandy with her daughter. He flags down an empty supply helicopter that's not allowed to carry patients. The pilot says he's not supposed to have other people on board. But Creswell refuses to take no for an answer. Mark Cresswell was like, look, can you take these people? And he was like, I don't think I can, you know, I might get in trouble. And there comes a time when you gotta throw the rule book out the window. Creswell persuades the pilot to bend the rules and delivers on his promise to reunite Brandy and Steve with their baby. He had the heart to just say, okay, these people really need to get to their baby and I'm gonna find a way. So thank you to Mark Cresswell. just after sunset. William Wilson is still waiting to be evacuated. Okay. Suddenly, the emergency generator truck sputters and dies. It has run out of fuel. William's life support machine is now running on batteries. Okay, look, there's only 25 minutes left on this battery. If the device had been turned off within 30 seconds, he probably would have succumbed. Hospital staff have brought a portable gas generator to the patio outside the neonatal ward. The cable is run into the room and quickly hooked up to William's machine before its batteries run out. But even this last ditch maneuver is a temporary measure. Hospital volunteers think of a way to produce a few more precious liters of fuel for the generator. In the garage, they siphon it out of the car's gas tanks. It's been 14 hours since Tulane's evacuation order. Staff have still not found a helicopter for William and his machine. Then a glimmer of hope from a hospital in Arkansas. Gotta go. They have a chopper, and it's big enough. It's also equipped to transport a critically ill patient. It can evacuate William from Tulane Hospital. It was heavy enough and large enough to fit the machine as well as carry it and the personnel out. The machine weighs 500 pounds. So that's kind of odd, hooked to a boy that weighs barely a 125 pounds. Just after dark, there are rumors of a new threat. Across the city, reports of random gunfire aimed at helicopters. This was a real problem. Several helicopters arrived, turned around, and left because of it. At this point, many people became very, very upset. No, no, we have a gunfire up here on the roof. We, we can't keep asking pilots to fly in here, Mel. No. Mel Lagarde, in consultation with his staff and the pilots, makes a critical decision. Okay, guys, I'm suspending all the flights until daylight, okay? We just can't risk it. We can't let anybody out. But William's portable generator won't last until morning. So the hospital will have to make an exception and get him out tonight. Don't forget, you promised me riding a chopper. But evacuating William tonight depends on whether the pilot from Arkansas is willing to risk his own life. We had learned that uh, the FAA had quote unquote shut down the airspace. And we made a call to Arkansas and I spoke to their chief pilot and he said, pilots will experience, he's gonna fly in. Midnight approaches. Hospital staff hear the sound of a lone helicopter. They just flew in literally under the radar into the city, 
that was dark, and the only thing that they had was the lat-long coordinates of the hospital, of the garage, and that's how they found it. As the helicopter gets closer, more spur-of-the-moment ingenuity. Four cars are parked on the roof. Drivers crisscross their headlights so the Arkansas pilot knows where to land. But William's journey to the helipad will be even more difficult and life-threatening than Drew's. First, a spare version of William's life assist machine must be carried to the helicopter so that it can keep William alive during the flight. My first thought, it can't be much harder than a refrigerator, right? The refrigerator's big, it's heavy. This machine's not as big, but it's very heavy. We got a dolly. We began to try and move it down the stairs, and it wasn't working. We nearly, we nearly lost the machine. Sit down. Squeeze. Simple as that, okay. William cannot be moved while connected to his machine. Stop. At any moment, this young man had two tubes coming out of his heart. At any moment, if a tube had dislodged, it would have been instant death. I promise. So Nurse Braham will have to hand pump William's heart while he's wheeled over to the helipad. He will literally be taking William's life into his own hands. Okay. One, two, three. The one, two, three disconnect moment was one of the scariest moments of my life. William's nurse isn't the only one who's scared. He didn't let on a whole lot, but he got quiet, and that's when we could tell something was going on. At the best of times, William's life assist machine only duplicates 50% of what his heart does. As Nurse Braham hand pumps his heart, that figure is reduced dramatically. He knows that the margin for error is slim. You're not running any races, but you're alive. If I take this machine away and I began to do this manually, you're at about 40-50% of that. So you're looking at about 10% of your normal function on this. As Nurse Braham and William arrive at the helipad, some unexpected news. William's machine won't fit inside the helicopter. As a result, it can't plug into the helicopter's power supply. William must continue to be hand pumped. There is no alternative which I was shocked by because they'd asked for dimensions and I'd measured everything as well as I could. And it wouldn't fit. And so the look was, what do we do? With only a fraction of normal blood flow, William is starting to feel sluggish. He's never been hand pumped this long. If the wait continues much longer, William's heart will fail. his caregivers have seconds to make a decision. What do we do? Do we continue on on hand pumping or do we try and fix this somehow? Do we shove it in? Nurse Braham knows that staying at Tulane is not an option. It's time for some split second ingenuity. And then one of the paramedics again looked on the bottom and said, hey, these wheels come off. The removal of the wheels is just enough to allow William's life assist machine to fit snugly in the helicopter. We slid the machine in, plugged it up, started the engines, off we went. It is after midnight before William and Nurse Braham can fly out. But at last, they're on their way to safety. It was a tremendous relief for me 
for the doors to close, the engines to spool up, and to feel the aircraft lift off. A few hours earlier, Steve and Brandy arrived at Lafayette Children's Hospital, anxious to find out what happened to their daughter, Drew, after she was evacuated. Brandy is reunited with her baby. We got into the, to the PICU and, you know, of course started crying again and, you know, she's, she's here, she's safe, thank God. At Tulane Hospital, staff are exhausted but ecstatic. 21 of their critical care patients have been evacuated. Not a single patient died. These were critically ill patients. A patient that was on a heart-lung machine that in 30 seconds would not have survived if something was disconnected. A patient who left the hospital with his chest open. A patient that was on a ventilator and was critically ill. Several patients that were on ventilators and critically ill. Every one of those patients not only survived, but did well. After waiting 10 months for a new heart in New Orleans, William finally received one a month after he arrived in Houston. William is doing very well now. Um, coincidentally, he uh, went to another transplant center in Houston, Texas, and was transplanted 31 days after he arrived. So. His story was successful in the end. He's doing great. He's growing up and growing older, I suppose. Mark Creswell spent nine more days in New Orleans rescuing victims of Hurricane Katrina. I did this interview, and uh, he asked me what the most difficult task was. And I said, you know, on a, on a regular day, a mass casualty incident, you triage the worst patients and you take them out first. You want to give everybody the best chance of living. And he said, essentially, you were playing God. And I wasn't playing God, I was playing paramedic. And that's what we do. Drew Schaff successfully went through several more operations and is now a healthy, vibrant little girl. Drew is a pistol. She gets into absolutely anything and everything she possibly can. I th honestly think she's making up for the, the four months she was in the hospital and couldn't do absolutely anything. She's a mess, <laughs> but she's great. <laughs> Over the course of a week, more than 1,200 people were evacuated from the roof of the parking garage next to Tulane Hospital, one of the largest evacuations of an American hospital in recent memory. Six months after Drew Schaff and William Wilson were flown to safety, the hospital reopened. Although when I drive by certain areas or go to certain areas of the hospital, um, there's, a, there's a very beautiful pavilion in the hospital called the Riley Pavilion. And I cannot walk past that area and not look down and think about what I saw during Katrina. The water, the debris, and it, it's just shocking. It's something that just will never go away. It was a happy ending in a city where thousands of hurricane evacuees are still waiting to return. Two years after Katrina, some homes are still in ruins, and parts of the city remain vulnerable to flooding in serious storms. <laughs>